presumptuous because I, when I got back from the lecture, I realized I hadn't provided a step-by-step mechanism, only a basic mechanism, which didn't prove how gravity worked. It was just an idea, if you like. So I came back from Nevada in 2007, and it took me eight months to figure out a step-by-step mechanism of how gravity had to work. Then it took me three years to find a way of explaining it. And that's what I've been doing over the past three years. And as I learned how to explain it, I then understood how electricity worked at atomic level, how permanent magnetism worked, why galaxies are spiral shaped, how the atoms constructed, all of the other answers begin to fall into position. Tell me this, could you, let's say you had unlimited resources, could you demonstrate this on an empirical level, a repeatable level? Let's say you had control of the super collider at CERN. Um, Would that be useful in in, uh, proving beyond any doubt that uh, what you're saying is accurate? I can prove beyond any doubt whatsoever, and I don't need the, the particle accelerator at CERN. Firstly, because there are no particles to no look particles, for. No particles, right. right. <laughs> They're looking for particles that don't exist. So, that, so that's a scam over there. An absolute scam. It's billions of dollars to fund all these Freemason scientists and keep them in a, in, in a job and keep them happy. Now, there are, what I've discovered is there are two particles, protons and electrons, like Rutherford discovered. There is a neutron, and the neutron is made from half an electron and half of a proton fused together. Now, the fusion, the corridor of fusion between the two halves is what they call today an antineutrino. But even that doesn't exist. It's just a corridor of fusion. And that becomes clear as we start to uh, understand how the, the particles work. You don't need the particle accelerator at CERN to prove what I've shown in the book. Every step of what I say in the book has been proven by modern science. There was uh, a patent application in 2007, and it was actually lodged a week before I went to Nevada. It's it's unbelievable, isn't it, the synchronicity of these things. Two of the most senior physicists in the world who work for the European Space Agency lodged a patent, uh, an international patent, uh, at the International Patent Office in Vienna. And they lodged it for a gravity wave generator. And basically, their gravity wave generator is exactly the same as what I'm saying, how the hydrogen atom radiates gravity waves. Now, basically, they didn't get their patent because the patent examiner says it seems to work. Let me tell you how they figured this out first, because how can you discover something if you don't understand how it works? And this is what the patent office was saying. And what they said was, They were doing experiments on gravity in the laboratory in Vienna at the European Space Agency, and they had very delicate equipment inside vacuum casings to measure the gravitational field. And they noticed, and I'm using artistic license here, they noticed that at certain times of the day, the gravity changed inside their glass box, and they couldn't figure it out. Eventually, they figured out that every time the guy downstairs in the office downstairs went for lunch, the gravitational field changed in their glass case. And they realized that what was causing the change was not the guy going for lunch, but every time he switched on his hard drive and his computer, the gravitational field in the room above changed. So they started to do experiments on CD drives, and they put a disc in the glass case, and it changed the gravitational field. (coughs) Excuse me. But they didn't know how. So they did more and more experiments, and eventually they finished up with a disc. And on the edge of the disk, north, south, east, and west, they put four magnets that were allowed to spin in the opposite plane. So the disk spins horizontally, and the magnets spin vertically, like propellers, if you like. So when they got the disk spinning horizontally, the disk drive, the magnets, they also got those spinning vertically, the magnets were giving off corkscrew-style radiation, but they didn't know that. All they knew was if they built this contraption, it changed the gravitational field. So they applied for a patent. They did a drawing of it. They did the disk. All this is in the book. They put the magnets on the edges. They spun the magnets, and they applied for the patent. The patent examiners came back, and they said, it seems to work, but we don't know what's causing this. We don't know if it's gravity, because nobody understands how gravity works. (laughs) Therefore, you're not having the patent, you see. Now... 
I don't need a particle accelerator. All of the experiments to prove every step of this mechanism have already been proven. The, the gravitational part, the anti-gravitational part, the molecular disintegration of matter, that's been proven as recently as the 9th of January this year. So every single step of what I've proposed in the book has already been proven scientifically, but the people involved do not know it. They, they're not aware of it, and nobody's brought all of the discoveries together. Well, what about getting a patent for something that demonstrates it, an anti-gravity machine of some sort? Well, now this is it, you see, and it's fascinating, <laughs> because they applied for a patent and didn't get it. So the question is, well, given that I understand how it works, why don't I rush off to the patent office, put the patent in again with an explanation of how gravity works, and I'd get the patent? Well, yeah. that's all very well, but what I discovered was hold on, Maurice, far I, uh, easier that, way to generate on. gravity waves. And and it's a way that is so simple, it's not patentable. All right, well, hold, hold on, hold on. We, we'll hear in scientist Maurice Cotterell's new book, Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century, looks at gravity, magnetism, and other topics in sort of a different way. Before the break, we were looking for practical ways that his conclusions about gravity might be put to the test. These guys who tried to patent uh, a device based on the same conclusions that Maurice has reached. Maurice, might we see you uh, as a billionaire the next time you uh, come back? Could you, could you, for example, build an anti-gravity flying machine? I could, uh, George, but you, A, I won't be a billionaire, <laughs> and B, I seem to have a knack of discovering things which cannot be patented. <laughs> That's the story of my life. And uh, this one cannot be patented because it's a natural process. And the reason I say that is because we've learned how the, the Austrians tried to uh, get a patent on their gravitational generating machine and failed. And what I did was once I understood how the atoms switch each other on, because it all begins with a hydrogen atom, the, there's, there are two types of atom basically. That, well, three types, but let's not get complicated. The, the hydrogen atom is, a, is the most simple of atoms. And because it's simple, it has an electron that goes around the proton, a bit like the moon going around the Earth. Now, that gives off gravity waves, corkscrew radiation. Now, one of the considerations of the gravitational force, if it is to work, is that it must, gravity, the source of the radiation must be equal in all different directions. And what that means, because Isaac Newton says every... Uh, object attracts every other object in every direction. So therefore, gravity cannot be specifically aimed in one direction. So because all of the hydrogen atoms in the, in the universe are pointing in a different direction, uh, this satisfies the first requirement. Hydrogen could be the prime mover, and I've, I'm saying it is the prime mover. The second consideration is that hydrogen must not, in, must not interfere with other hydrogen atoms. Radiation from one hydrogen atom must not interfere with another one, otherwise you'd have chaos. You'd have one hydrogen atom causing gravity in one direction and another hydrogen atom trying to cause hydrogen, uh, attraction in another direction but failing. The third consideration is that there is, with more complex atoms, atoms with more than two electrons, the larger atoms, the shells, the orbiting shells of the electrons are offset by 45 or 90 degrees. And because of that, as the electrons orbit the middle of the atom, they bunch together. And as they bunch together, it makes the atom top heavy from side to side, it tumbles like tumbleweed. So large atoms do not spin like the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has one electron which goes around the equator of the middle of the atom and spins. So it gives off corkscrew-style radiation. Other atoms don't spin, so they tumble from left to right, from top to bottom, up, down. They have no coherent movement. Now there is a fourth consideration if we've got to figure out gravity, and that is to fit in with Isaac Newton's observation that gravity from the sun and the moon pull together. In other words, when we have a full moon and, a, and, and the moon and the sun are in a straight line, then we get a higher tide on Earth. And when the moon and the sun are on opposite sides of the Earth, with the Earth in the middle, we get lower tides. So 
we've got to take that into consideration. In some way, hydrogen from the sun must switch on hydrogen from the moon or atoms in the moon so that they pull in the same direction. Now, once we've uh, accommodated each of these requirements, it becomes clear that the hydrogen atom gives off corkscrew radiation. The corkscrew radiation spins larger atoms. It causes them to spin coherently. It stops them tumbling and starts them spinning like a spinning top with a whip. It starts to lash them. This corkscrew energy spins atoms in alignment. That atom, once it begins to spin, gives off its own corkscrew energy, and that triggers a chain reaction. Once I'd figured this out, it's a very simple mechanism. Once I'd figured this out, then it becomes quite clear that if you want to generate unlimited quantities of gravitational energy, all you have to do is put one of every element that we have in the universe in a container and line them up in a straight line. Now, there are, uh, the biggest atom we've, we, that we could possibly have on Earth has 120 positive charges in the middle and 120 negative charges orbiting the middle. That's the biggest atom we could possibly have once we understand how atoms are made. What that means is we can have 120 different atoms in 120 different containers. So we can have, for example, in the first container we fill with hydrogen. In the second container, we fill with helium. In the third container, we fill with lithium. In other words, we fill all of these containers with the next largest atom of the periodic table. And then we line them all up in a straight line, and hydrogen triggers the helium. The helium triggers the lithium. The lithium triggers the beryllium. The beryllium triggers it, and it goes all down the chain, and eventually, halfway down the chain, the heat will be so hot that the, the containers will start to melt. Okay, and that's again, all you I... need to do to generate unlimited quantities of energy. Now, that can't be patented. I can't patent 120 cans and put them in a straight line. <laughs> I can't do that. It's a natural process. And that's why I can't, if I can't patent it, nobody can patent it. So anybody can start generating heat energy using gravitational energy by simply lining up every single element in the periodic table in a straight line. Clearly, the Earth's gravity will interfere with this string of containers. So they would have to be vertical with hydrogen at the top. Well, again, let's, let's get practical for a second. Uh, all right, you can't patent that, but what about a machine that relies on that, an anti-gravity machine, an anti-gravity propulsion, flying machine, for lack of a better term, a, a UFO. Now, you, you mentioned that you came to Nevada, you spoke at a UFO conference, so I would hope, hope I'm not putting you on too much of a spot here, but a lot of the uh, attributes uh, described by witnesses uh, suggest that these are incredible, uh, intelligently controlled propulsion machines. A, a guy I interviewed starting back in 1989, named Bob Lazar, said he worked on these black projects, that uh, these machines were acquired from somewhere else, that they basically generated gravity. Would it be possible to generate gravity in a, in a craft to, under your theory, and to harness that energy to create a flying machine, something that could travel in interstellar distances? Oh, absolutely. No question about it. Easy, easy as anything. In fact, you had a guest on, 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 on Coast to Coast some time ago because somebody sent me a disc and I listened to it. And he was describing how his, I'm not sure if it was the Searle, Searle generator. Searle? Searle, yeah. It could have been. But this guy had this machine and he said when it starts it up, it, 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 it sucks all the heat in from the room and the room goes cold. Well, that's exactly how gravity works. Gr uh, atoms suck in ambient heat from the room and convert it to gravitational energy. So as long as the temperature in, on Earth or in space is greater than minus 273.15 degrees centigrade, that's absolute zero, as long as there is some heat or light around, every object will radiate gravity waves. Now, yes, we can uh, this make flying saucers. The problem is we can't go faster than the speed of light. And this has nothing to do with Einstein's fanciful thinking. Nothing whatsoever to do with that. The fact is, once we understand about hydrogen bonding, how hydrogen and oxygen bond together to form water and living tissue, we begin to realize that gravity waves hold water together. 
So if you go faster than gravity waves, which is the speed of light, like all radio waves, then what will happen is the hydrogen bonding will fail because the, you, the body... If I were to travel faster than the speed of light, my body would be going faster than the gravity waves holding it together. So my body would disintegrate as soon as it got to the speed of, of light. 